well, first, thank you to Björn for inviting me. It's amazing to have a captive audience on Friday afternoon so late. You've got nowhere else to go, so you're stuck here listening to this. And my talk's rather different from all the other talks in that it's going to be sort of nanoscale type stuff. No modelling, just the real thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a kind of a, quite a long preamble to my talk because I'm going to talk about deformation mechanisms in shear zones. Seeing deformation through the eyes of mineral replacement processes means that I have to explain a little bit about mineral replacement processes. <coughs> but even before that, my background's in mineralogy and I have a certain perspective on the development of the subject which relates to how we interpret um, mechanisms. So I'd like to say a little bit about that as well. A bit of history. Just a couple of slides. <coughs> Something about the development of mineral phase transformations which I worked on for 25 years. Mineral and rock deformation. And this question, why are all interpretation of processes in minerals rocks dominated by solid state mechanisms. My pet theory on this is that the era of modern mineralogy, which is kind of when I came in, um, started with these Apollo return missions. And the, the people who studied the minerals and the microstructures and the processes that were going on in the minerals were all material scientists. There weren't any earth science people at that time who were suitably qualified really to look at minerals in the way that material science looked at them. And so there was a really big emphasis after this in places like Cambridge and a lot of places in America that to be a, a proper mineralogist we really had to learn material science um, because in material science things were well developed, there were well developed theories and after all minerals were just materials. Material science largely dealt with dry systems. This book was very influential, um, edited by Rudy Venk and it introduced the idea that we can look at microstructures in minerals and that they give us a record of the processes that have been taking place. So in this book there are well, some of you, ha Hoyer was a material scientist, worked for US Steel, I think. Um, Gareth Thomas. There are chapters in here on deformation, which are, could be lifted pretty much from any textbook on metal deformation. Another quite influential book at the time was Jean-Paul Poirier's book on creep in crystals. I don't know why I'm drying up. <coughs> Published in 85. And the reason I showed this is this juxtaposition in the subtitle. Deformation processes in metals, ceramics and minerals. Okay, puts in high temperature, which kind of makes it okay, I guess. But if we really, if we start looking at large-scale deformation, do we really believe that the creep laws that work for metals and ceramics work for this kind of deformation. The mass transport in this is, is related to the sort of classical ideas of dislocation creep. That's one of the things that I'll be questioning. But the advantage of this was that there were well-established theories of phase transformations which we could just lift. Um, and so the concept of minerals as materials became a sort of central platform for a lot of teaching and a lot of the the philosophy. So um, there was an enormous uh, effort in determining diffusion coefficients and that's another possible question we could ask. What did diffusion coefficients do for anyone in earth sciences? Um, except on a scale of, you know, electron microscopy. That's just trying to get a bit of, a bit of peep back up. Um, we, 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 had, we developed quantitative approaches to thermodynamics and kinetics and it's interesting actually to look at early thermodynamics or early say books in um, metamorphic petrology like Turner and Verhoegen 1954 and, and you find that if you read the bit on, on, um, on reaction mechanisms in metamorphism it's fantastic, everything is there. Nothing's quantified 
but all the ideas are there. And if you look at the later books of Turner and Verhoeven, where you get to quantify things, unfortunately the fluids have to go out, because we didn't know enough about the thermodynamics. And so the fluids are sort of tacitly in there, maybe as catalysts, but not really um, dominating or not really taking a major part in, in the reaction. So there's a kind of a solid state mindset in interpreting processes, even those that are demonstrably not solid state. <coughs> so if we want to talk about fluids, okay, everyone agrees that fluids make things go faster. But if we take a simple situation like this where, where we have a fluid that's out of equilibrium with a mineral, and of course, to us, the answer is obvious enough. How is this going to equilibrate? But, but it, it's actually amazing that most, a lot of models give you a diffusion profile as if you're going to equalize this chemical potential by diffusing stuff in the, in the, in the mineral. Maybe at some very high temperature, this may be the case, but, um, I would, I would contend that this mineral will try to equilibrate with the fluid by dissolving. So, <coughs> I'll give you a, this talk's going to be shorter than 45 minutes, so you can all kind of feel I don't have hundreds of slides. I only have 60, but I'm churning through them pretty quick. So we can discuss a few things. Um, this is sort of telling you as it is. Fluid mineral re-equilibration. How does a mineral re-equilibrate with a fluid? When a fluid interacts with a mineral phase with which it's out of equilibrium, it'll tend to dissolve, full stop. Now, the resultant fluid may be supersaturated with another phase. And this will almost always be the case for complex minerals. If you took quartz, okay, you know, quartz re-equilibrates by dissolving slowly, and that's it, because that fluid was not supersaturated with respect to anything else. But even, say, if you took aragonite and you start dissolving aragonite, of course, the fluid at the interface is supersaturated with respect to calcite, which is less soluble. If you take a complex silicate like plagioclase, you, you will find that the fluid at the interface, depending on the temperature, is supersaturated with a whole lot of things, depending on the fluid composition and depending on the temperature. So that you always have the possibility that the product phase may nucleate within this interfacial fluid. So the whole body of fluid in your bucket doesn't have to ha have anything to do with all of this. It doesn't know about it. Because as soon as you dissolve a small amount of solid, if that interfacial fluid is supersaturated, you have the possibility that will nucleate. And it will nucleate perhaps on the very surface that's dissolving. And you will set up an autocatalytic feedback such that the rate of dissolution will be faster because you have a solid s s um, nucleated on the surface. Now, of course, there's a lot we could say about what controls nucleation kinetics, but I won't say much about that except a couple of things a few slides on. What we find very often in experiments and what we see evidence for in nature is that this dissolution and precipitation may be coupled in space and time. In other words, you can replace one mineral by another by what we call this interface coupled dissolution precipitation. Now this has a lot of curious characteristics. You, you pseudomorph one phase by another. You keep the external form because the external form is defined by the fact that your nucleation may be on the original surface that's just beginning to dissolve. You transfer crystallographic information because the nucleation on a surface will have some epitaxy, it will have some crystallographic relations, and so it's possible to transfer crystallographic information. Now these are all the hallmarks of what people would have called a solid state reaction. Because how can you preserve the external shape of a crystal and the crystallography and say it's dissolution and precipitation? God, I must be nervous. <coughs> right. Um, I'm not going to spend the whole lecture talking about this. I've talked about this a lot, but this is just a preamble for those who haven't heard this before. Here's an example of a very simple experiment we do with undergraduates. This is Carrara marble. It has the, uh, has an, uh, the advantage that's actually got 
grain boundaries and a nice grain size is 500 microns. But if you just take Carrara marble, which is pretty pure calcite, and put it into a solution of, um, what do we do? Uh, ammonium phosphate, just, just a phosphate. It doesn't have to be ammonium. Just something containing phosphate ions. Clearly, calcite's out of equilibrium with water with phosphate ions in it. It'll begin to dissolve. And the calcium from the calcite interacts with calcium, the phosphate, and calcium phosphate's very insoluble and you produce apatite. So all this white stuff is appetite, and it's an interesting experiment to see to what extent um, you get grain boundary migration of the fluid. We can do this now with, we do it with oxygen 18, I won't show you that, but you can map the oxygen 18 in this um, from the fluid, and the oxygen 18 actually goes into the phosphate, um, goes into the appetite, the phosphate of the appetite. You can track it with Raman spectroscopy. Um, but the other thing to point out is this is porous. If this wasn't porous, all these little black dots of porosity, if this wasn't porous, this whole reaction couldn't proceed because we have to have advective transport of fluid all the way to every point of reaction. Now, the porosity is a transient phenomenon. Like any microstructure, it's, it's transient. It might go away. It might coarsen. It will change with time. <coughs> so these are all issues that are related to this interface coupled dissolution precipitation. I think you can see the kind of potential of this sort of simple experiment for modeling flow along grain boundaries, and that's one of the projects in this, um, in this new Marie Curie thing. So here's a little cartoon of interface coupled just to round this up. So we have a crystal, we have a fluid, the dissolution of even a few monolayers of the parent may result in an interfacial layer which is supersaturated. This product phase may nucleate on the surface of the parent, this blue stuff. The porosity generated. Well, most people in metamorphic petrology think that you, how can you generate porosity in a rock where perhaps you even have a molar volume increase? The molar volume of the solid is not the critical thing. It's the relative solubility, the relative solubility, not of the parent and the product in the particular fluid we have. So we can replace one appetite by another appetite very easily. It has a solubility product of 10 to the minus 80 or something. Things can, you can replace impure gold by gold. It doesn't matter that the absolute solubility is low because you never have much stuff in solution. It's only at the interface that you have the material in solution. And so th this porosity generation is a very important part of this whole story and it's pro probably our bit of the contribution to this because people have talked about this kind of um, replacement processes. Um, Phil Orville talked about it. Had he lived longer, it would have been interesting how he would have taken the whole subject. Um, so we've kind of revived some of the old bits and done a few new bits. And so you can just move this in interface through a crystal. <coughs> so, how relevant is this to metamorphism? Well, if we look at textures of metamorphic rocks, here's a gabbro, here's a eclogite. Um, we do see these kind of um, similarities. We see the or orgite, the pyroxene here is replaced um, by omphacite, and the plagioclase is replaced by garnet. And there's uh, issues which I've we've been discussing the last couple of days about to what extent these kind of reactions are isovolumetric. Here's another example of a um, of a, a, a eclogite being replaced by a blue schist. So um, this is the blue schist here. This is a sort of diagram of it. And you can actually see these invading fronts. Um, and, but if you actually look in detail at an omphacite, we see it's replaced by glaucophane. So this is the, glaucophane is the, is the mineral in the blue bit, which is replacing the green stuff, which is omphacite. And we see that we have this, this is a very typical texture we see, um, where we have what definitely seems like an isovolumetric replacement, even though the molar volumes of these things are quite different, <coughs> which means that you have to write reactions to preserve volume 
And this was first said by Lindgren in about 1912, so 100 years ago. Just another couple of examples. Not very far from here is the Bambla sector where you have large volumes of rock, this stuff, where the, the plagioclase, the sodium calcium feldspar, is replaced by albite. And here is a kind of front where this is happening. And this coincides also with this thing precipitating a bit of hematite, so it looks red, so it makes it easy to find. But this is an important picture, because once again, this is a rock that's, um, what, a, a, how old is it, Hawkeye? A billion years old? And, and here we have the original feldspar from the original protolith, the rock before. We've had an albertizing fluid, a sodium-bearing fluid. These numbers here, for those who are not familiar, this just means this is more calcic than this. The, the crystal structure is the same. And here we see this kind of dissolution precipitation front, all these little black spots of porosity. We have some uh, mica also formed here. And this is a real rock collected in hand specimen which still has porosity, which would imply, if we've preserved this porosity, that below a certain temperature this rock has stayed dry. I mean, you know, above a certain... In other words, nothing much has happened to it in terms of recrystallization. Um, if I had a bit of an aside, I could start talking about closure temperatures for metamorphism and for geochronology, but that's another story. Now, when we strip out, when we albertize a lot of rock, we basically strip out all the metals. And where do they go? They form mines. This is the area around here. This is, this is the Bumbler area. And there are different kinds of mines that have been worked at different times. And this is quite typical of larger scale things like in Australia, where you have albertization on a massive um, volume and this is associated with mineralization because the, the charged fluid carries all this stuff for hundreds of kilometers. All petrologists have no problem with that concept. How long does it take? Well, if we do some experiments, and these are some experiments that Jörn Hervelmann did <coughs> some years ago, and you just take, take a nice gem quality um, oligoclase it's called, the cal calcium bearing plagioclase, and you heat it up for, well there are different kind of experiments, but talking about sort of hydrothermal temperatures for a couple of weeks. And here's a partial rea reaction front. So this is, like geologically speaking, a twinkle of an eye. So these processes are fast. They're fast in, even in diagenesis, you can convert um, plag detrital plagioclase to to albite at temperatures that are very low, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, and so on. So these reactions are fast. Um, while they should have very characteristic sharp boundaries, these are not diffusional fronts, it's not a diffusional exchange, it's actually a dissolution precipitation front. And here are just some other pictures where one can see the, uh, the exchange of metals, of, uh, you know, what come, what goes out and so what comes in, in these kind of things. So we've got a lot of experiments like this now, and basically by choosing the correct fluid, you can convert anything to anything, literally. Now I'm up to talking about deformation. So how much time have I used? I about 10 minutes, 15 minutes? <coughs> I have 15 minute more talk. Deformation. Well, if you, if you think that if you agree that metamorphism involves these coupled reactions of dissolution and precipitation, and if we also know that metamorphism usually involves some deformation, then what's the mechanism of deformation? How are fluids going to affect deformation? Well, the standard mechanisms for deformation, and again, I don't have much time to talk about these, are all sort of solid state type mechanisms. Dislocation glide, diffusion creep, solid state diffusion through the crystal, herring nabaro creep or through grain boundaries. But we also increasingly see um, the importance of dissolution precipitation creep. Um, and there are a number of papers ever since, uh, well, Bob Winch was talking about this quite some time ago, but now I'm finding that I'm, you know, seeing more and more papers where people are showing that even in rocks like in garnet deformation, pressure solution or dissolution precipitation creep 
um, is quite, is important even at high grade, fairly high grade conditions. So we're looking to see where's the boundary between these different um, dissolution mechanisms. So how might mineral reaction and deformation overlap? Well, that's the big, big question. So if mineral reaction takes place by dissolution precipitation, can we say that deformation will take place that way? So here's our field area, <coughs> our natural laboratory. Wonderful. I mean, to come across this, you've got to think, you've got to be impressed. I mean, it's one fantastic place, especially in a fresh road cutting. So what we have here is we have these rocks, which, which themselves are very interesting, which are these anorthositic, um, uh, anorthosites and, and, and also more basic rocks. And these are the, the granulite basement rock. This is, this is about, it's been dated about 930 million years. And then it sits there for 600 million years, 600, 4, 5, 6, 7, 500 million years, with not a lot happening, quite happy. And then it gets st struck by this Caledonian orogeny, which brings in all kinds of stuff and fluid and everything else. And so the response of this rock to this Caledonian reworking is to produce um, shear zones. This one happens to be amphibolitic shear zone. You also find um, eclogitic shear zones. And these are all over this area here called the Bergen Arc, which is not very far from here and been studied quite extensively um, by Hawkon and many others. And so this particular place where the outcrop is, is just, just there. And um, so these are nap structures um, as, uh, associated with the orogeny. And I, perhaps I should say, therefore, that um, that what we're looking at is is, a, is effectively the root the root zone in the crust of what was a big mountain belt. So by studying what's going on here in terms of what's frozen in and what structures we see, it might give us some insights into the sort of things that may be happening under, um, say, Himalaya now. So this is the ultimate aim, and it's not a unique aim. Everybody would love to know how these feedbacks work between fluid infiltration, mineral reaction, deformation, how strong is the rock, when do you get rock weakening, and so on. So I'm going to show you some data. Uh, first, there's Hawkon for scale in this same outcrop. Now, if we look at this outcrop in a bit more detail, we see, for a start, it's very heterogeneous um, in terms of... Um, the sort of texture and what I'll show you is influx of fluid. I hope this is a pseudo tacolite. Good. I labelled it before I consultant, consulted the guru. Um, we see brittle failure. We see pseudo tacolites through here. We see this whitening of the feldspar. The dark feldspar, this kind of brownish purplish, not the garnet, but this stuff here, is effectively is the granulitic feldspar. So we could say that it's relatively unaltered, this stuff here. Um, when we look at the white feldspar, it's really totally been reacted by fluid. Um, if we look in detail again, once again, we see this heterogeneity both in, in the fluid infiltration, so we could say the white part is, is kind of the fluid infiltration, um, this, and also, as we'll see, in the style of brittle or ductile deformation that w that we have even on this scale, and we'll see it goes right down to thin section scale and smaller. If we, how do we know this white stuff is hydrated? Well, here's just a quick picture, which I'm not really going to explain in detail. This feldspar is absolutely shot full of zoezite. It has a background of sort of these all this zoning of different kind of feldspar compositions. It's, it's, it's what we would expect to have if we had a fluid passing straight through this thing. So we're talking about fluid passing through single crystals and converting them, in this case, to something else. But when we find this, it's a bit tough, you know, because it's all happened. So what we've got to find always are interfaces. We've got to find an interface between... Okay, I'll put a few other things in. An interface between the unreacted rock and the reacted rock. Right, so what are the first signs, and I'll run through this fairly quickly, I've forgotten I put all these ones in, but uh, what are the earliest signs of fluid mineral reaction? Well, this is the granulite, and it's pretty nice, you know, it's, it's, it's um, 
is it's not very reacted. And the first signs of reaction are that we actually see these coronas, these, these reaction fronts coming through here, where if we look in a bit more detail here, we see the, the feldspar is invaded by this stuff called myrmachite. It's a two-phase intergrowth. The clinopyroxene is being replaced by amphibole. And this is sure sign that you've got fluid coming in along this grain boundary. And we can follow this kind of thing in more and more detail so that you get thicker and thicker reaction zones and and so on. So there's no doubt that we have a lot of reaction going on here with infiltration of fluids. Now I'm not going to talk about all the other phases, I'm just going to talk about the feldspar because the feldspar makes up a huge proportion of the crust <coughs> and we, if we understand how feldspar deforms, that's a start. Okay, this is just the last, almost the last picture of, it's not, these are just optical images. The feldspar are, in the granulite tends to be cataclastically twinned. We're not sure whether this is the response of a dry feldspar to the shear or whether it's something that already exists in the granulite. We need to do a bit more work on that. But what we see in, into these feldspars is we see the signs of reaction where this feldspar, which is the granulitic feldspar, starts to be replaced by kind of a mix of quartz and clinozoazite and kyanite. The sodium all goes out, so we have fluid mobility here. And if we start looking in detail at the fronts here, we see there's just a lot of stuff going on in this feldspar. It's no longer nice and kind of homogeneous, more or less as we might expect in a granulite. With a bit of luck, we find these fronts. Now this is a, this is the unaltered feldspar, kind of unaltered. And here we see an interface between the first stage of feldspar re-equilibration. This is anorthite 50, and it's breaking down to an intergrowth here. The um, darker stuff is anorthite 25, and then the paler stuff is anorthite 64. Four, yeah, the more calcic one. So we've got a, we've got something that's in the middle of a solid solution breaking down. And there is reason to believe, uh, that that would happen. But, but that, I may come to that at the end, but what I'm more interested in is what's happening crystallographically here. How, this is all a single crystal, and what's happening here? Because already, by fragmenting this material, we could maybe even call it chemical fragmentation, we make it potentially a lot weaker. Um, so we do EBSD. EBSD is electron backscatter diffraction in a scanning microscope. You have to tilt the crystal. So this is the, so the backscattered image is no longer so pretty. This is the unaltered feldspar and this is this, this intergrowth. And this is an orientation map. Um, and a band contrast map, in other words, this band contrast tells us where the sort of boundaries are and grain, uh, sort of apparent grain boundaries. But if we analyze this in detail, this may seem like we now have a lot of different orientations here, but they're all related by twinning. They're all 180 degrees apart. So essentially, what we've done is we've taken this parent plagioclase and we've made it look like um, many different grains, but they're all effectively part of the same crystal or twinned. So we've preserved the crystallographic orientation. Now, those of, there won't be anybody much here, but they, you know, back in the old days, people knew about plagioclase and what it was all about. And if you take anorthite 50 from a granulite and look at it in TEM, it's not homogeneous. Because anorthite 50 is not stable, we don't know anything about the stability of plagioclases even within the simple solid solution. We know a bit, but sort of went out of style a bit. But if you look at in TEM, you see this stuff called the Burgild intergrowth. And it's actually an incipient solid state exolution. So it already has more calcic, more sodic, more calcic, more sodic exolution. And this is as far as solid state ever gets in plagioclase. This is 500 nanometers. That's, that's where diffusion, solid state diffusion is important. And then it just becomes irrelevant from then on. Um, if we look, um, so what we're saying here is this, that this two phase looking intergrowth here is effectively a, um, a coarsening of 
a chemical heterogeneity that existed already. Let's go back to this complex two-phase stuff here. We can do a fib cut, which means we cut this sample with a focused iron beam and we look at it in a transmission microscope and this is, shows the sort of complexity of it. This is the sodium rich part. The calcium rich part is actually full of subgrain boundaries which I haven't totally understood yet. But nevertheless all of this with all its complexity is all effectively a single orientation or its twin. Um, if we now do EBSD on a larger area here of this complex two-phase feldspar intergrowth, we once again see that all the orientations are either exactly the same on this, um, <coughs> on this um, pole figure. Um, and so these two colours, the green and the red, are just one orientation or it's twin, with some very slight misorientations um, because of the fact we have produced some subgrains here. So th th this is the first thing that happens in this. Now, so the interpretation here is that we've had some fluid infiltration, we have a phase separation, could be a coarsening of this nanoscale exclusion intergrowth, and already this fragmentation is a potential weakening mechanism. Uh, let's go back to the shear zone. As well as this shear zone, whenever you take a thin section of anything over here, you find lots of little shear zones. So here is, well, that's what it looks like in the shear zone. Um, and that's what the grains look like in the shear zone. And in the, and, and in also the much finer shear zones that, that spread through this rock. What we see is a polygonal sort of foam texture, it's often called in material science. It's an equilibrium texture happens when things just um, like grow from a fluid. But we also see that it's got some zoning, chem chemical zoning. And if we look at an interface between this and our previous, th previous complex two-phase feldspar, um, we actually see that in this polygonal feldspar in this shear zone, so this is the shear zone here, a sort of a mini shear zone, we we, we preserve the, some of this zonation. Now it's still a bit mysterious to me how we go from here to here, but now if we do EBSD on all of this and we look at, say, the orientation of lots of grains, here we see the interface between the, this two-phase and the shear, and we see that um, we now go from, this is a, a band contrast map, so these are all the sort of subgrains. We go from this to a rather coarser texture, which now seems to have rather more different colours in this orientation map. And if we do all the pole figures for all of this stuff, um, I'll just run to the, last, the next one, I think it's the next one. It takes a while to, it's, it's got a lot of data points on it. Oh no, it's not the one I want to show you, but okay, I seem to be jumping around here a little bit. I'll go to the pole figure. Um, in the shear zone, the, the, these are point analyses of um, 400 different grains in the shear zone. You see the difference here between what we had before and what we have now. We basically have no crystallographic preserved orientation. If we go one step back, <coughs> um, this it was a TEM image of this polygonal feldspar in the shear zone, it has very little microstructure, very few dislocation microstructures. The orientation of the crystals in the shear zone don't bear any relation to any glide planes in plagioclase. So basically, the criterion that people use when you have no crystallographic preferred orientation is that this did not deform by dislocation glide. In other words, this deformed by some other kind of mechanism that involved fluids. That's my conclusion. So, just to summarise a little bit where we're at, the recrystallization of the two-phase plagioclase um, that we had in the, in the original granulite, five minutes, good, um, transforms a chemically complex zone plagioclase um, into a polygonal feldspar microstructure where individual grains are random. So, the interpretation of this would be that if we have increasing fluid infiltration, we have more pervasive mineral reaction, we have rock weakening, we ha and, we, and we, we, we crystallize this feldspar in the shear zone, 
in a region of low stress. There's very, no, not much stress here. We have a lot of ductile deformation um, due to the fact that we are basically crystallizing this from, from by this sort of dissolution precipitation creep. Just to show you the last couple of slides of how heterogeneous this is, this is uh, the regime here where we have this two-phase feldspar. We have um, kyanite quartz. The garnet is being replaced by kyanite quartz here. This, I would say, is a sort of low fluid regime. Not much fluid here. That must be fluid because you're transporting sodium away and all kinds of other things. Over here, the other side of this garnet is being replaced by amphibole and chlorite, and we have this shear zone. So this is where we have high fluid infiltration through the shear zone, producing this polygonal feldspar. Once again, just nearby, we can find brittle fracture in the same thin section. Um, the garnets all broken up and so on. So we have this heterogeneity and where we have low fluid infiltration, not much mineral reaction, the rock is strong and it fails brittly. And that's the conclusion. <coughs> So on the outcrop scale, variations in the alteration are all related to the degree of fluid infiltration. On a micro scale, the variations in the textures are also related to the degree of alteration of the rock and degree of fluids. The fluid induces a phase separation. Eventually, it leads to polygonization and grain size reduction. So in the, in the shear zone, the grains are much smaller than in the granulite where they were big, but they went through this in-between in transition we have we, we retain chemical signatures here, so we have to look at more in more detail about how these grain boundaries are actually growing. They obviously don't totally dissolve and recrystallize, although in coupled processes you can retain a lot of chemical information, even zonations. So the conclusion is that in this shear zone we're looking at the de the um, de the deformation is by dissolution precipitation creep. And um, just the acknowledgements, we've been working with Hawkon on this. Delta Min is a um, EU network that's just coming to an end. It gave us a lot of opportunities for travelling and looking at rocks. And thank Ollie for some help with EBSD. Thank you, thank you very much.